Mark is 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 amazing. Uh, man, it's all amazing. This 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 the word of God. But I want to show you one little simple principle that is huge. Verse. Let's just yeah. Let's look. At, just jump in at verse twenty six. That's safe. I'm just looking because. I mean, you could back up, not being funny, you could back up to 21 and look, a, a lamp is, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? Man, arise, shine, church, your light has come. The glory of the Lord is risen. Yeah, but there's darkness. Yeah, keep listening. And darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But the light's upon you. <laughs> light is greater than darkness. It's not about darkness, it's about the light. So let your light so shine before men. It's all about manifesting him, manifesting truth, manifesting love. When you're talking, when they were sharing this one testimony, you girls were sharing, what's your name, hon? Karen. Yeah, Valerie's friend. You were sharing how, that's a good thing, Valerie's friend. You got it going on. When they were sharing about, and you heard her getting emotional, and they're going into this story about this lady. Could you hear how much she cared about the lady? You know, you're sitting there, and if you don't understand, you're thinking, one lady, yeah, one lady that was worth the blood of Jesus Christ. One lady that God cares about. One lady in the middle of a congregation. One person. Yes. Yes. So is it small? No, it's huge. Is there something I should do or can do? Is there something I'm doing wrong? What do you want me to do, buddy? Is something dragging or bumping? Let's just get it, yeah, fixed, because I can't hold still. If you want me to hold still, you've got to pray hard. <laughs> <laughs> My pastor used to try to teach me years ago, you need to learn how to stand on an eight and a half by eleven. Isn't that good? Didn't distract a thing. Holy Spirit's still here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, I'm sorry. I'm having fun. <laughs> so, so do you light a lamp to put it under a basket? No. So let your light so shine. <clears throat> Christianity is all about letting your light so shine. It's not about going to church. It's about being the church. That doesn't mean we don't assemble ourselves together. I'm not saying anything bad about going to church. But it's not going to church. It's assembling yourselves together to be sharpened in Him. But it's all about in the going. The coming and the going has a unique marriage. It's so important to come so that we're more equipped to go. And the reason we come is so we're encouraged to go. So that we redeem the time because the day's evil and we leave a legacy and we make the most of opportunity. Or we become religious and attend church services and do our Christian duty. I bet there's more than that. <laughs> I bet it's let your light so shine and love people. I bet the way we've been loved, we start loving. I bet the way God's given to us, we start giving. That's why it's so important to receive mercy. Because if you really receive mercy, you'll become merciful. You know why some people aren't merciful? Because they haven't received mercy. Sometimes we fail to love because we haven't just been loved. And I'm not talking love. I've been loved. <laughs> I've been fathered from above, birthed again into a living hope. How are you doing, man? It's good to see you, Hank. Forgive me. Just, yay. Hi. <laughs> haven't seen Hank for a while. Good to see you. Gospel's still true, ain't it, buddy? It's still rolling, too, ain't it? <laughs> I met Hank. It's global. First, first time I met Hank. It's global school, Randy school. It's good to see you, buddy. Wow. i got to read this. Verse 26. The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. Man, we're here, we're here to scatter. The kingdom of God. Everybody wants to know what the kingdom is like. Well, we know that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. But here's a principle of how the kingdom works. Multiplication. You scatter seed on the ground. You sow something for something to grow. 
You're not the end result of that something. You're the sower of that something. God's the supernatural power that brings it to pass, but you sow the seed. Sometimes you're just tilling and plowing the ground of a person's heart. And somebody else that's walking in divine purpose and understanding sows seed into that ground. Somebody else comes along like yourselves and just waters that seed. And God's on it. He understands this whole process. Isn't that sweet? It's just amazing. Let's not lose sight of that and make this thing so difficult. Let's not carry something on our shoulder that's too heavy to bear that Jesus didn't ask. If the burden's not light and the yoke's not easy, it's not Jesus. If it's not out of rest, it's out of flesh. Come on. Come on. <laughs> it's out of rest. Come unto me, I'll give you rest. And from the place of rest, we cease from our own works and we become love. We're not trying to save people. We're loving people and God saves them. It's so simple to me. A lot of people don't reach out beyond themselves because they feel like there's too much responsibility. They've got to cover too much ground. They've got too many bases to cover. We bring up the whole thing about discipleship, etc. There's a place where people get truly born again where they say, what must I do to be saved? And there's a place where we, we can follow through with that. But, but the clearer we give them the message and the more clearer we speak, the more grace comes on their lives. We're just trying to get them into heaven if we're not careful. And they still have the very trials of life. Their minds don't get renewed. Their eye doesn't change. I don't just try to get people to heaven. I talk to them about our created value and who, who, who they're created to be and who God sees them to be now that the sun has come. I give them understanding of the gospel so they can put something off to put something on. I'll just be bold about this. It's, it's, it's not an accident that Todd's the way he is because it's all he knows. And he believes it. He's a son. He's redeemed. It doesn't matter that he's 22 years drug addict. None of that matters. It doesn't matter that he wrecked things. It doesn't matter. What matters is he was created for God's glory and he was created to bear God's image. And he went, yeah. And it's all he knows. It's not an accident. What I shared with you this morning is all he's ever sat under. It's the only way he can think. So it's the only way he lives. Amen. It's not an accident. It's reproduction. Yeah. It's truth. Made manifest in dreadlocks. <laughs> I said, the devil knows him as the dreaded Christian. <laughs> oh no, it's the dreaded Christian. <laughs> but it's true, the manifestation of his life is the fruit of what he believes. Come on. Some of us are gifted in ways that we haven't even received because we, we don't see past ourselves. It's God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. Some of us have callings we haven't embraced because we don't see ourselves. The closer you grow to God in your identity, the more is revealed to who you really are and what you're called to, and the more it'll spontaneously just flow out of your life without trying. Amen. Come on, I don't go out and try to love people. Maybe I gotta love them. It's impossible to just love somebody apart from the grace of God. It's impossible to just see somebody's value because we've been trained our whole life. First impressions, face value, outward appearance. Jesus said judge with righteous judgment, not outward appearance. What it means is the more you see yourself, like I said this morning, for who he sees you to be, the more you'll see others for who they are and love becomes spontaneous. All of a sudden you have time for people. It's simple. If you understand this, you'll start scattering seed. You'll sow seed. What I want to do is keep this thing so simple that nobody's under pressure. Like when you go out there, you can't even fail. We're just pumped that you're going out with a fresh conviction. I'm as simple as guy as this, that you're just out there understanding and realizing that you have the privilege to love and you have the privilege to approach people and you're being more conscious of the people around you than maybe before you even came here. That to me is a start. Where God takes that is immeasurable. That's a big deal to me. How do you measure a seed placed in God's hand by faith? Man, where this can take you is beyond measure. Man, next thing you know, you cross that line of a little bit of self-consciousness, a little bit of, oh, what are they going to think? A little bit of oh, how you feel. Next thing you know, you just cross the line. You say, oh, no, we're going to walk around one more time. Next thing you know, you're just loving on somebody and God moves. And you say, oh my goodness, that wasn't hard. What was I thinking? Well, next thing you know, you love. Next thing you know, you just can't help but to love people. Next thing you know, it becomes so real. It's so who you are and it's flowing with power. And a year from now, it's like all you can do is cry and man and 
Jesus, and you're pumping gas, and you can't even get away from the gas pump because there's somebody there, and God just loving. And you know what I mean? The bigger this thing gets in you, right? But you start somewhere. You got to start somewhere. Doesn't God grow us up into him? Small seeds. Man, don't despise small beginnings. Don't think nothing small. Nothing small. Don't think anything small. It's not. You're deceived if you think it's small. Because you don't know where that seed will take the person's life. There's people you won't even know the outcome of what's happened. That's why you stay in faith, you stay encouraged, and keep loving. If you let your heart get discouraged and you start reading things face value, or you see things through a negative eye, you'll stop sowing seeds. You won't be encouraged to keep releasing faith. You'll be deceived into this stopping this great kingdom process that's on the earth to manifest. Isaiah 61 says, as the garden causes the thing sown in it to grow, so shall the Lord cause praise and righteousness to spring from the earth. What's he saying? His analogy is the garden. Sow in seed, no seed, no growth. Whoever looked out the window waiting for the stuff to grow and they never went out and planted the garden. <laughs> Come on. You sow into people and God causes it to grow. It's simple. It's right here. The kingdom of God as is if a man would scatter seed. Look, look how simple this is. And then in, in clear conscience, in peace with God, he just goes to sleep at night. He doesn't lay and worry and wrestle and introspective and condemn himself and think he's not doing a good enough job and not serving God right and not sowing good enough quality seed and maybe I didn't do enough. And you know people do that to themselves? Ah, come on. People do that to themselves. You're not under that kind of pressure. You're loving people. You go to sleep at night. You get up in the day. And guess what happened to the seed? While you were sleeping. While you were nowhere around. My goodness, it sprouted and grew. <laughs> and see himself does not know how. I bet you God can do that. I bet you when you love somebody unconditionally with no string attached, now they have to deal with that. <laughs> They're face to face with unconditional love. And they have to face it and deal with it. And that's a good thing. You walk away. And until you walk away, they don't even realize it's unconditional. It hits them after you walk away. All of a sudden, their guard's down and they feel safe in the fact that they were loved and there was no condition on it and no expectation. All of a sudden, it becomes about them, their worth, their value, and all of a sudden, God's ministering to their heart. You hear what them guys said to him? Who he said, he said it to this one fellow. Well, there you are, man. Was that you that said about the, the guys at McDonald's? Yeah. Did you hear what he said? Man, if there'd be more Christians like you, the world would be a better place. You hear that stuff on the streets all the time. You hear people say, man, and then you can encourage them, listen, don't wait for the whole world. Man, if this example touched your life, know that it's your life too. You have the same value, friend. You can love people. You've got two options. You can let the world harden your heart, or you can love the world with the heart of God. So what are we going to do? Are we going to let the world manipulate us, man, or are we going to let God have his way through our lives? Right then, you can pour into somebody with passion right there. You get it? They see God in you, they acknowledge God, they honor God, and all of a sudden they're making it like about everybody else, and next thing you know, man, it's your privilege too. Do you respect what you see in my heart? Are you able to receive what you see? Do you see it sincere? Yeah, friend, you can live sincere too. Man, don't let the world eat your lunch anymore. Don't let your heart be hard for any reason. Christ has come. What you see in me is the evidence of Christ, and he's in me, and he wants to live in you. <laughs> You just go for the <laughs> spiritual juggler. <laughs> it's in love. It's in passion. It's, oh, it's not com that's not compulsion. That's not pressure. That's somebody seeing something in you, and you say, man, it's your calling, too. Man, it's your destiny, too. Mm -hmm. Man, we've just been a product of what we failed to see, friend, but today you got a good firsthand look at the love of God. Man, it's a whole lot more awesome to love. What do you say? Let's pray. Just cry out to God. Let's become love today together. What do you say? Yeah, man. Next thing you know, he's given up all his hurts and forgiven so and so and praying. You'd be amazed when it come out of somebody. But if you have that grace, you can go for it. None of that is ever my motive. My motive is loving him sincerely, period. We call them Holy Ghost drive-bys. They're so quick sometimes. <laughs> Serious, they're so quick sometimes that you just touch somebody and you keep moving. You can tell they're in a hurry, you touch them, and they're like, 
Oh my gosh, especially little words of knowledge. You don't make a big highlight and a big deal out of it all the time. Sometimes you could say, man, how do you think I know that? That's really weird. Are you psychic? Well, no, but, you know, and you tell them. Other times, word of knowledge, boom, and they're just, you just leave them with the marvel of that. How did they know that? Get out of town. <laughs> and you didn't try to sell them nothing. You're already around the corner and gone. But you mentioned his name. And it's above every name. Yes. That's right. And that's what'll stick in them. That's right. Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? Yeah. Oh, come on. Yeah. It's be about your name. It's about his name. There's times this Holy Ghost drive by like that. Just boom. I remember running over to a man praying. He got in his car, and he was already in his car, and it was really hard for him to get in his car. And I went over and I just whispered through his window and talked to him. He said, "Listen, man." Prayed for him, and he had three surgeries, all kind of pain in his back. And he was like feeling a little affronted and like, man, right in the parking lot, come on, man, I want to back out. I want to go, I want to light one of my cigarettes. He had his packer. I'm like, man, listen, dude, you got nothing to lose. The worst that can happen is nothing, and that ain't why I'm praying for you. Just give me 30 seconds. And I've said that to people, and they're like, well, I got 30 seconds. And that's the thing, you want to hold them to that. You don't have to pray a four minute prayer. Don't put your faith in your ability to pray. You put your faith in what the finished work of Amen. Jesus has done. Amen. You can just say, be healed in Jesus' name. Pain go, affliction leave. I remember touching this guy real quick. Don't pray people long prayers with people. Don't, don't, don't break off all the curses and mention all the, and then break off and all, and I go back to the great, 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 great granddad and the great, 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 and the great, great, and the great, and the, just be healed. What do you say? Just be healed. Jesus' name, okay? I know I sound a little cynical, but you can't go out there and pray some four-mile prayer and expect them to understand when you might just be trying to find faith in your own heart. Just believe the finished work of Jesus and his love for them. Okay, here's a good one. Watch this, because I'll finish this testimony about the guy. You see something in somebody's body in public, and I hear people say this a lot. Well, I don't have faith for that. Wonder if you're not supposed to have faith for that. Wonder if you're supposed to have faith in God, in God's love for them and the finished work through Christ and His ability to change that. Wonder if you're not trying to have faith for that, but God's amazing and measurable love for them that can change anything. Wonder if your faith is in God and His ability to flow through you representing that truth even though you can't produce a thing apart from Him. Wonder if your faith is in God's immeasurable love for the person. So if you see their value in God's love for them, that probably qualifies for the working of God's Spirit. So I bet I'm not under pressure. And I bet that can teach us to see every situation the same instead of some things big and some things little. I'm having faith in God. Jesus himself said, have faith in God. What's that mean? Faith that God's love is the same for them as every man. And through Jesus, he's proclaimed that and he's finished the work to set them free. So what do you say we pray? The lady, that was Valerie, said uh, about somebody at work and didn't want to lose her job, don't pray. Man, you know, some people just feel that way and say, but you're not limited in that. You can, you can, you can, there's so much you can do in those situations. You can do something simple like this. Well, look, uh, you, are, you are my waiter. You're going to be waiting on me. You're coming back to my table to fill my drink or whatever. Here's what I'm going to do. You keep working, man. You do what you got to do. But I'm serious. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to pray for you. When you come back and fill this glass or do whatever you do, you tell me how your back's feeling. Because Jesus is coming to touch you, friend. Amen. You pray. And they come back to the table. <laughs> Dude, you got to be kidding me, right? <laughs> <laughs> Serious, you're not limited in stuff. It's not like you have to, you know, pray, you know? Now, which is Zach vertebrae? Put your hand right there. Come on, you can take their hand and pray, and he can heal their ankle. You, don't, you know what I'm saying? But what I'm saying is don't limit God, don't limit faith because of the circumstances. There's always a way to believe and let love flow. Man, you know, you don't even have to try to talk them out of that. If they're sincere, there's people that are sincerely, look, man, don't want to lose my job. You don't have to, man, and I'm not going to put you on the spot. I'm here to bless you, not put you under pressure. Man, you keep waiting tables and stuff, but I tell you, me and my friend here, we're believing God. He's coming. That area might even get warm in your body. You're going to feel your knee change. That pain's coming out of you while you're walking around here. You'll see, man, Jesus loves you. He's amazing. 
and you pray, and let God be God. Be honest, man. What's up? He, you won't even have to ask him. He'll come by your table. Dude, I didn't make it to the second table. You know, stuff like that's available. The sower sows what? Seed. Man, you don't make the seed grow. You sow it. What keeps it alive? This is important. What keeps the seed alive that you sow? Faith. What's faith work through? Love. Come on. When you sell out up here and start saying, well, I guess that didn't amount to much. Well, that wasn't no well. I don't think they received well. I don't, you, know, you, know. you know how negative we tended to be sometimes in life? We just find the worst in everything and then speak it. That's a trap. That's the wrong kind of prophetic utterance. <laughs> Come on. Who knows that we've tended to grow up that way? Believe in the worst, seeing the worst, picking out the worst, focusing on the worst, troubleshooting, highlighting the answer to it or the problem to its use and forgetting the answer along the way. Come on, who, who can be real and say we've tended to live with that? You can do that when you step out in loving people. You get this little voice come, try to get you to introspectively evaluate everything in hindsight and come out with some negative review. Nope. God, what an honor to love people. What an honor to trust the working of your spirit in their hearts. What a privilege to say hi to her and just give her that little word and just that little gesture or token of love that she received. And I just thank you that you can work miracles through that, God. God, while she's laying on her bed tonight, you can minister to her your love. You can cause that seed to grow. God, what an honor to love people and believe your kingdom is moving. You get it? Come on, anything less is going to discourage you and you're not going to sow seed. And the sower sows the word. And the kingdom of God is like a man scattering seed. The kingdom of God's on the earth and it's in us. So how else is it going to get out of us? Is it in us to be in us or in us to come out of us? If you believe in me as the scriptures say, out of your belly. <laughs> Rivers of living water. Look, the well springing up into everlasting life is my born-again experience that assures me of everlasting life. But it's one thing to have that. It's another thing to be a river flowing out. This he spake of the Spirit who had not been yet given because he was not yet glorified. John 7, 37. But now he is and the Spirit's here. So what do you say? Let the river flow. Amen? Amen? Okay, I'm going to read here quick. And then I want to cover something. You should sleep at night. Okay. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that the grain in the head. That's amazing to me. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts the sickle because the harvest had come. You know how Paul says some reap where they haven't even sown? And we all rejoice together. How simple is that? That means some of you are sowing vital seeds that lead to the reaping of lives and you never see it. Somebody else does and we'll all rejoice together. Isn't that cool? Some sow, some water. God causes the... You might have been a sower. You might have been a water. You might never see the harvest. You may never see the increase. But I'll tell you, if you'll stay faithful in this principle we're talking about, when we end up in that day and all things are revealed, you might be amazed what God did with pure love through your life. It might be amazing. And what the devil was telling you was no big deal. Might have been a big deal. I bet if it wasn't a big deal, he wouldn't be wasting time trying to tell us it's not. <laughs> I bet if there was no power here, he wouldn't spend so much time trying to talk us out of it. Yeah, amen. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> amen is right. Yeah, that's just good. That's just clear. So you got to think that way, man. He's a deceiver. He's not telling you you're unworthy because you're unworthy. He's telling you you're unworthy because he's afraid you ever see your worth. Come on, every time a lie like that tries to demean your life, you ought to lift up your voice and cast down the lie by submitting to truth and let truth make you free. Stop fighting the devil and yelling at him and pleading the blood over your mind. Proclaim truth and crush the lie. You get it? You cast down every vain imagination that rises above the God. You go, oh, what you're doing ain't mattering. Da, da, da. You lift your voice and proclaim faith in every seed you've sown in God's faithfulness to work according to love. And love never fails. And God, you're rocking the earth with who you are. Your mind's like, 
You'll never be anything. You, 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 you. Father, I thank you. I'm a son. I'm redeemed. Sins are forgiven. I'm righteous and white in your sight, pure as snow. God, you're amazing. Eh, 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 eh. Father, you're just so... And the more he speaks, the more I'm established. The more he lies and whispers, the more I'm in love. The more he pokes me, the more I know God. Sounds like godly warfare to me. Instead of tired up praying all night, I plead the blood, I plead the blood, I plead the blood. I plead the blood, I plead the blood. I got the mind of Christ. I got the... And by the morning, you're wondering if the gospel works, if you even have the mind of Christ, why the devil has so much power. Why? Because you're fighting the devil instead of submitting to God. Submit to God. He's resisted. When you submit to God, He's resisted. Yay! It's another simple one step program. <laughs> <laughs> one step program redemption through Jesus submit, resisted, flee so your adversity is a greater springboard to revelation so every time you're tried you come out with a greater understanding of God when you trust who he is he's given everything to you you fight with truth truth is your hope of freedom not annex of warfare come on we're trying too hard to be what we already are. <laughs> and then we get forced to living sensual. Unless we feel loved, we're not loved. Unless we feel the peace, we don't have peace with God. No, you have to believe to become. You believe to become, and out of your becoming, you begin to do. We're trying to do to get to where we're already seated. Does that make sense? I'm right with God, period. You can't, it's too, way too late. I'm right with God. And because I believe it, I experience that. I don't need an altar call to get prayed for to feel right with God. I don't need an altar call to feel the love of God. God loved me through Jesus. I believe that. Love was manifested. Christ cried out, I love you from the cross. And God said, I love you. That's enough for me. I don't need any other sign or wonder. And I grow from that place. I don't need you to touch me and feel goosebumpy and oozy goosey. I, because then I'm going to learn to live sensual. And if I don't feel that way, then it isn't that way. You're wrong. It is that way. Love never fails. He loves me today. He loves me tomorrow. Whether I feel him or not, he's right here as close as the mention of his name. And he's in me and he'll never leave me. Come on. Come on. Amen. Just live by faith. God's not teaching you to live sensual. He's teaching you to live by truth. Truth. Come on. We've got to get on this stuff. It's a big deal. We're letting senses rob us. We're letting things we don't feel and feel be determining factor instead of what God has spoken through His Son. In these last days, God has spoken through His Son. Brought me a lady in a service one time. She, 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 was, she was emotionless. She looked like she was on serious psych drugs and she wasn't on any. She just believed the lie for six years. One of those ladies that worshipped with flags and twirled her little thingies and you'd mention Jesus and she'd cry. But she did something against her conscience. She did something she knew she wasn't to do and she did it. And then the devil came and said, you've done it now. You knew better. You're lost. God's not with you. You had a revelation. You were enlightened and you walked away. You sinned willfully. You're lost and God's left you. The more she listened, the more she believed it. And some scriptures were going through her mind that tried to validate it. And all of a sudden, she got this feeling of being lost. It was coupled with a lie and a feeling. So for six years, the church is trying to minister to her. Cast out the devil, anointing her with oil, taking her through all kinds of sessions of stuff. What's the matter with this lady right now? Is she demonically bound or is she deceived by a lie? What does she need, ministry or truth? of oil or truth? truth? Casting out of devils or truth? What makes you free? Like yeah. <laughs> yeah. Simple. One step program. They bring her up, got her by both arms. That's how she walked. I'm not kidding. I said, honey, what's going on? How can we pray? She said, I lost God. And I can't find him again. She totally believed that. It made her empty inside. She felt empty. She was believing that. And here's what she was believing. Until I don't feel lost, 
I am lost. That's what she's believing. She doesn't need you to try to cast the devil out of her. <laughs> now, some of you might not totally understand this, but it's just the way it is at times. I wasn't making fun of her. I said, honey, what's the matter? How can we pray for you, hon? And I'm thinking in my mind just by looking, this is psych drugs. She's going through schizophrenia or something, bipolar. We just need to pray. When she said that, I went, <laughs> you're kidding me, right? And I just got silly. I laughed. I'm like, you're kidding me. Well, I wasn't making fun of her. I was demeaning the lie. The lie was so silly to me. She's not silly. She believes the lie. I'm like, you're kidding, right? <laughs> and I realized she's not kidding. And I got a little discernment, and I said, honey, this is amazing. I said, you are such a woman of God. I said, I can see that years ago, something happened that violated your conscience, and you believed you crossed the line. You believed you separated yourself from God, and that feeling came upon you. She's not moving, shaking her head or nothing. She's just staring at me. I said, honey, and now you're waiting not to feel that way to know everything's okay. I said, honey, it's impossible to lose God. It's impossible for him to lose you. I said, he's as close as the mention of his name. He'll never leave you, never forsake you. His mercy is greater than judgment. His love never fails. Sounds like it's stuff in the Bible. <laughs> Probably believing the Bible would be good. <laughs> I said, pray this with me, hon. See, I'm not under any pressure. I can't make her free. I'm not trying to. I'm telling her who she is. I'm not trying to muster up the power. The power's in the truth. Oh, there's times the anointing needs to flow like fire and whack things and drive things. I understand that. In most cases... We need to stop believing the lie and embrace the truth. And when we don't do that, we make such a stronghold out of the lie. At the cost of truth, it's there to make us free. And we make something already crushed immovable as we keep trying to do other stuff. When do you just believe he loves you? Well, I can't believe he loves me because of all these things. And you have to sit somebody down and tell me you can't afford not to believe he loves you because he believes, you believe he loves you through Jesus, not all these things. you got your eyes on all these things. All these things are deception. That's the problem. You see God's love through Jesus, and you explain the gospel again, and you be patient with people whose love is patient. You say, well, they're not getting it. They need a supernatural encounter. No, they're called to faith, and they need truth. Do you get what I'm saying? So you be patient with people, and you keep sowing truth. Or we grab for straws and we weigh outwardly and we say, well, this isn't working, let's try this. This isn't working, let's try this. That's what we do. Come on, some of you have been in the church long enough to know that's what we do. <laughs> so I want you to pray this with me, honey. Say, Father, I thank you that you love me. Well, she hasn't even considered that for six years. She hasn't even considered that for six years. Years. She's believed the total opposite. She said, Father, thank you that you love me. And Father, thank you that you're right here. Father, thank you. Go pray for the rest of the people. And the music's crazy. And a lady that was 32 that had metal rods and scoliosis and was walking like she was 85 with rheumatoid arthritis got completely healed and danced off the hook. Rods and metal all through her body, dancing like she's never had a pain in her life. And the music's crazy. And it's close to midnight, and I looked, and everybody's dancing. And I'm like, whoa, all night church tonight. We just, so I just, jumped, I just jumped in with them. I turned and looked, and who's over along the wall with the flags and the banner? Six years robbed of freedom that's already given in Christ. 
because of believing one lie. And we're trying to attack it with strategies of ministry instead of truth. And there's a whole lot of stories I could tell you. That's not like one story. Truth is amazing. Your best friend, Spirit of Truth, he'll guide you in all things concerning him. <laughs> Y'all all right? I just feel real good about that. Verse 30. To what, Mark 4, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Boy, these are amazing questions Jesus is throwing out there. So we ought to listen when he's talking like this. Because you know he's to tell us. He's just about to tell us, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God? You know. If there was ever time to listen, it's right now. <laughs> Watch. <clears throat> or with what parable shall we picture it? It's like a mustard seed. What? The king of God? I thought it was like lightning and fire falling on the earth and wrecking people. <laughs> I'm playing with you. <laughs> Come on, lightning, fire, wreck people, right? But... But watch what Jesus said. It's like a mustard seed, which when it is sown on the ground, it's meaning men's hearts. When you see ground, you, you're talking symbolic. It's men's hearts. Right? Watch this. When it is sown on the ground, it is smaller than all the seeds on the earth. There's so many things shouting in people's lives. There's so many things trying to grab their attention. There's so many things yelling at the top of tone. And sometimes this little seed that you sow seems so insignificant in the face of all the stuff. It's smaller than anything going on in their life. But God's in it. <laughs> oh my goodness. All this loud, raw stuff, God ain't in it. It's just blah, right? But, but God's in this little, teeny, seemingly insignificant. See, that's why the just live by faith. They don't sell anything short. Because with God, all things are possible. And all things are possible to them that believe. We're believers, right? Oh my goodness. So if the seed is teeny, but God's in there. You get it? Come on, I'm just preaching good. This is good. This is encouraging. Isn't this encouraging? Come on, if you don't see this stuff, you'll be deceived and discouraged in the kingdoms on the earth. God is still God and Jesus is Lord. And our hearts aren't up and our hopes not up. Must be seeing the wrong thing. Good tidings, great joy. We ought to be pumped. Good tidings, great joy. Or you're letting something else be the barometer of your soul. You live from the gospel. Not for the gospel. If you live for the gospel, you'll think everything is too much pressure and you can hardly go on. If you live from the gospel, you get a right perspective and you just keep on marching. Come on, that'll preach. I could break that down for a while. You don't live for the gospel, you live from the gospel. It's the foundation in which you function. It's what makes you tick. You getting that? Yes. Okay. It's mustard seed. Man, I feel passionate about this. <laughs> Forgive me for my passion, but don't. <laughs> Come on, if, if, I'm not, if I'm not pumped, it's, I'm not even giving you good news. We might as well go home. It's good news. Right. <laughs> this one fellow graciously said, man, that first session this morning, I feel like I could go home. I got what I came for. I'm ready to rock. I said, man, you just hang on because it's just getting started. <laughs> I, appreciate your, I appreciate your comment, but we just getting rolling. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> man, when it's sown, it's smaller than what? Than all the seeds on earth. But this seed's from the sower. This seed's from heaven. This isn't, this isn't a seed on the earth. Oh, you getting this? 
This is the gospel seed. Come on, you look, you look through the Old Testament, the armies of God always seemingly outnumbered. Enemy always bigger. Big Goliath, little teeny David. Outnumbering armies and little tiny. You got Gideon's band. You got all kinds of stuff like this going on. You got lands of giants and we're grasshoppers in their sight. You got that analogy all through the Bible. And yet he is God. <laughs> Come on. This seed, smaller than any seed on the earth, but yet it's the most powerful because God's in the middle of that seed. You crack that baby open and Jehovah comes on out of there. <laughs> oh, I'm preaching good. <laughs> Come on, you got to live by this thing. You got to get your brain washed. <laughs> Don't be afraid to be out of your mind. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so you're out of your mind, you can't be entrapped in his. And don't be afraid to be out of each other's minds, too. <laughs> out of mine and out of yours, that's a good place. <laughs> I'm not being mean. <laughs> I'm a happy fellow. Smaller than any seeds on the earth, but when it's sown. What's the priority here? What has to happen? Whew. You see it? It's going to make me cry. But when it's sown. Do you think Satan knows this stuff's in here? Do you think he's freaked out by this stuff? Because if we'd ever just believe, <laughs> we'd just start sowing the seed and rejoicing and praising God. Amen. And he's desperately trying to talk us out of it and desperately trying to get us to see something less and desperately trying to get us to cycle and spin and make nothing of much. You get it? When it's sown, guess what it does? This is in your Bible. You need to look at this. Verse 32 with me if you have a Bible. When it is sown, guess what it does? It grows up. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Come on, is this too childlike for you or is this all right? Or is this isn't a deep enough revelation? This revelation is life-changing. Yes. Guess what the Bible tells me what happens if it's sown? If it's sown, it grows. Wonder if you need to sow by faith to assure it grows. See, faith is never, it's not even here, because faith shouldn't even be the question. Everything we do is by faith, because faith works through love. And I'll tell you, we're the ones that uproot the seeds that we sow through a negative confession and a mindset that changes down the road, or we look with our eyes, think with our mind, and uproot what God's in process of doing. If, if we don't get a hold of this, one day we'll see that God was about ready to do a lot of things uh -huh. that we were created in His image to represent and to uphold and to release through faith and prophetic utterance and standing in position, and that we bowed out right before deliverance, right before breakthrough, right before transformation. I, I, I'm a gardener. My garden's blessed. It does good. It always does good. And one year I planted beans and they just didn't come up. And I went, what? That ain't God. That ain't my garden. That ain't the blessing on my ground. My ground is blessed. <laughs> and I went out there and I started to think, well, you know, it's funny. I was thinking, well, we have had real cold nights. The average ground temperature's less. Than, we're, we're below average. I guess they're just taking longer to germinate. Another day or two went by. And I'm thinking about it now because I got my eyes on what ain't coming up. So I bend down and I start digging right in that row with my finger where I put them first couple beans. And as I'm digging, if you know gardening, when a seed's sprouting, it's got that tap root going down in there. When you disrupt that and pull that out, you, you killed that seed. I'm digging in that row and I flip out this bean and right as I'm digging, I flip it out inadvertently. I rip the whole thing out. Here the shell split wide open, the leaf's coming out and the root's down in this far, popped right out onto the soil. And God instantly spoke and said, Dan, my people do it all the time. I sat there and I cried in my garden. I cried in my garden and interceded and said, have mercy on us, Lord, that we stop looking with our eyes and thinking with our mind and pulling out what you have growing. Come on, come on. Saying no when you say yes. Changing our mind when you never do. I bawled and interceded. I was glad for the whole experience. 
I stood up and I thanked him. My beans are coming up. My garden's blessed. Sorry, I had to see to believe. <laughs> you know why blessed are those who believe and haven't seen more than those who see through believing? They both end up in the same place. So what's the difference? If you believe through seeing, you still believe. If you believe and haven't seen, why is the one that hasn't seen more blessed? When they both end up believing. It's a good question, isn't it? Because you don't put yourself through the hell of unbelief until you see. Hello? Have you believed, Thomas, only because you've seen? He says, be believing, Thomas. Don't be unbelieving. Touch my hands. Feel my side. <gasps> my Lord and my God. Thomas, have you believed only because you've seen? Thomas, I tell you, more blessed are those who believe and haven't seen. Why? They both end up believing. Because the whole while his soul's in torment. He's worrying. He's wondering what's going on. Is he really raised? Isn't he raised? Will I ever see him again? Or won't I see him again? Toil, turmoil, can't sleep at night. The one that's believing is resting in his faith, resting in his king. And he's more blessed than the man that has to see to believe because he already believes. Why? Because of what the Lord has said. <laughs> I come down here to preach the gospel to you guys. <laughs> and we're just getting rolling. <laughs> Yay. I hope I'm not having too much fun outwardly because I am feeling fun, so I'm just laughing and having fun. When it's sown, it what? Gross. Grows. You better believe it. Don't you do like me in my bean garden. Don't you look with your eyes and talk yourself out of faith. Don't you say, well, I ministered to them. I don't know how many times. They ain't going to change. You can tell they ain't going to change. It's going to take a miracle. No, it's going to take you staying faithful in love. Because when you pull out a love on them, then you send them the message that you've given up to. And I guess God gave up on me, and there's probably no hope for me. And so you represent the heart of God in situations. You represent the person of God. Do you understand that? That you're God's choice to represent who He is in a situation. That when people see you, they see who He is. We rightly represent Him to the world. When you back down, when you give up, when you give in and, and give in to unbelief, you're actually painting a picture to that person that if you, the believer, can't even believe, what hope do they have? If you ran out of gas on them, then all of a sudden the condemnation gets greater and they say, see, man, I, yeah, I guess love is temporal. Well, if they burned out on me, I guess God long burned out on me, man. Next thing you know, they go to smoke another line and go deeper and spin more and justify it because what's the use? <sighs> When it's sown, it grows. And it doesn't just grow. This is so profuse. Man, we'd be good to believe this. You know, I, I know we're mean well, and it's, it's my own life. I'm talking to me too. I haven't come to the place where I scripturally, gospelly, the word believe, believe everything that's in this book. I'm growing in him. I'd be seeing even more in my life if I believed everything. Believe means fully persuaded and convinced. My identity and all that stuff. There's things of supernatural power, release, God changing the body in many ways. God's just doing things that I, I, I'm still growing. That's why I'm camping in his love for people because that's going to bring the breakthrough. Remember, I'm not having, trying to have faith for the problem to be fixed. I'm having faith in God's love for the person and his ability to change the problem. God's ability. Come on, we all say we believe the Bible and the Bible says he breathed into dirt and a man stood up. Human being. Come on, think with me. He formed a pile of dirt, breathed, and brain and bones and lungs and human anatomy spinal cord stood to its feet. <laughs> a man. Come on. Do we even believe that or is that just Bible? <laughs> a man. I wonder if that same breath comes upon the person you're praying for. I wonder if that same breath has been released through the resurrection of Jesus Christ and it gives life to all men. I don't believe God in the garden went, <gasps> if he did, I'm still impressed. I believe he just breathed. I believe it was intimate. 
I believe it was personal and full of heart. I don't believe he tried so hard. And you and I came out of that breath. Because when Jesus was resurrected and put his blood on the mercy seat, the first thing he did to his disciples is tell them they have peace with God. And then he breathed on him and took him back to the garden place where once again man was in the image of God. Yeah. See, I believe what I'm telling you. It's what's wrong with me. <laughs> he breathed back into us life. We're not lacking any good thing except what we fail to see. When it's sown, it grows, but it doesn't just grow. It becomes greater than all the herbs, all the things, all its surroundings. I'm telling you, it's greater than all the things of the earth. And things can find shade there and nest there and shelter there. It's pretty powerful, isn't it? Awesome. I want to cover one more topic with you, okay? I got a lot of time, man. I think God backed up my watch or something. <laughs> We could have took a couple more testimonies, Tom. I might run out of things to say. <laughs> that was a joke. <clears throat> okay. We talk about praying for the sick out in public a lot because Jesus told us to. He said, as you go, heal the sick, Cleanse the de uh, lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. That was Matthew 10. In Luke 10, he said, whatever city you're in, heal the sick there and tell them the kingdom's here. So if he told us in those places of commissioning and sending out, it must be a big deal to him to restore people and heal people. Why? Because sickness and infirmity and affliction is a direct result of the fall of man and the sin that had come upon the earth. The fact that Jesus was sent, he brings us good tidings of great joy, peace to all people, right? Peace on earth, goodwill toward man. He came to the law of the spirit of life through Christ to make us free from the law of sin and death. He came to remove sin. He's the remission of sin, the Lamb of God who taketh away sin. So when he takes away sin, right, through the mercy of God, then the effects of sin must be destroyed through that same mercy. If God's going to see us apart from sin, then the effects of sin must be destroyed. What did he tell the paralytic? Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. And they squabbled in the background and talked amongst themselves. And he said, why do you think evil thoughts in your heart? What's easier to say, forgiven of your sins, or get up and walk, but to show you he's forgiven, get up and walk. The evidence of forgiveness was his healing. He bore our sin in his body on a tree that we, having died to sin, its consciousness, its identity, its stain, its sting, that we have died to sin, lived to righteousness, by his stripes were healed. <clears throat> Why is that thrown in there? Because it's not thrown in there. It's the direct result of a righteous identity. I'm, I'm judged apart from sin. God sees me as if I've never eaten the tree. I'm righteous in his sight, so how can unrighteousness stick to me? You're like a Holy Spirit Teflon pad. It's like, yeah. What happens is, when affliction comes, when we get tested in that faith that I'm proclaiming, here's what we do. I wonder what I did wrong. I wonder what door I opened. I wonder, and we throw our identity out the window with the trial. And we get introspective and take the responsibility instead of just seeing it's the devil trying to shake my faith and we're letting him do a good job of it because we go introspective and put it all on us as if we've done something wrong. I wonder if it's just the devil just messing with your head and just in the face of your faith and it's time to stand in your righteousness and declare God's love and let God blow that thing off your body. Amen. Come on, who would agree that when you get in trials, <clears throat> what did I do wrong? What door did I open? Where did I leave a foothold? wonder what I'm missing. I wonder if there's an unconfessed sin. I wonder if, huh, he, huh. And when you do that, you're undressing your righteousness. You're slipping out of your robe. Yeah. You look too good in your robe. Don't get naked and be ashamed. Yeah. <laughs> Put that baby on. You're looking good. <laughs>
Come on. Making sense. So what heals people? Why is there healing on the earth? God through Christ is reconciling men back to God, not accounting their trespasses against them. Did I read it this morning? That's why we don't judge men, we love men. Even when they're caught up in sin, we see their value and we minister to that value. And God releases his kingdom because the blood of Jesus is crying mercy to the earth and Satan can't stop the mercy of God. So he believes he can stop mercy in you and me. Because he can't stop the mercy of God, but he can stop the mercy of God in his church. That's what he believes. He believes he can't stop God, but he's sure he can stop us. He's sure he can make it all about us. Just receiving from God instead of becoming like God. Come on, get over that whole phrase when I say becoming like God. Don't be bothered by that. We're predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Who he predestined, he called. Who he called, he justified. Who he justified, he glorified. By filling us with the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Come on, this is God's idea. It's not my light bulb idea. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can possibly be against us? If he didn't spare his own son but delivered him for us, how shall he not give us all things through the son? All things, better vats and barns? No, all things to look like him, to be conformed to him. Everything necessary to manifest him. Because oh, it says, who can bring a charge against God? It's God who justified. Who can condemn you? It's, it's Christ who died and furthermore raised from the dead and sits at the right hand of God and his blood mediates for you and cries mercy for you. Speaks better things than the blood of Abel. The blood of Abel marked and judged Cain. The blood of Jesus sets you free. Yeah, so be healed. Be free. Be delivered. Why does healing flow on the earth? Because the blood of Jesus is crying from the mercy seat of God. Because God has forgiven men of their sins, not just yours, but those of the whole world. It's in your Bible. Yeah, but they got to repent, repent first, brother. Will you show me where Malchus repented when he got his ear healed? You show me where all the people that got healed and still didn't believe him, John 12, 37, repented. And we're still healed. Don't you make prerequisites or you'll subvert your own faith in the, in the love flow. All of a sudden, you put it on people and you stop the revelation from flowing out of you called love. Because then I guess you're saved by works. I guess you earned whatever you have. I guess you lined up first. <laughs> Come on, I'm preaching. I came down here to preach. The truth feels good. <laughs> feels real good, Deborah. You're so beautiful. You are just beautiful. Yeah, how long have you been saved? I just see him in your eyes. You shine. Keep shining. Amen. Yeah. I pray for you. Hey, that's okay. That's him. That's just his love. I just, you be encouraged, Deborah. Because what you do matters. And the things you do are important to God and the kingdom of God. You are significant in this family. And I bless everything you set your hand to, and I thank you the blessing of God is upon it. Father, I thank you revelation upon revelation of her worth, her value, her purpose, her destiny, God, and even her legacy. I thank you. This is a woman that lives by faith. I thank you she never grows weary in well-doing, and I thank you she manifests your loving kingdom everywhere she goes. Bless her, God, with greater. Bless her with more. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now watch this. We got so much teaching in the church that it produces unbelief in our own lives. I'll give you an example. Somebody comes down for prayer. We go to pray for them. In their telling us what they need, they're talking a little much. You know what I mean? Problem driven and overwhelmed. I'm not condemning them. I'm just saying they're talking a lot. And in their talking, they're expressing fear, doubt, negativity. And we're like word police, and I'm like, eh, oh, that's fear. Mm, that's an open, oh, my God, that's negativity. Oh, my God, no wonder you're in that case. You're just, gee, well, you're reaping what's your son. All of a sudden, you got like five strikes against them, or at least three, and you got three reasons why they're probably not going to get healed. When Jesus didn't give you any reasons, they gave you some because of your knowledge. 
Jesus didn't give you any because of his love. Knowledge puffs you up. Love edifies. Next thing you know, you pray because it's the Christian thing to do, but you're not expecting anything. You've just allowed what they don't see to determine what you do see. All of a sudden, you made them the foundation of your faith instead of his finished work. Come on. I'm going to prove this to you so scripturally and nail this thing down. There'll be nowhere to run or hide. I'm t- I got so much time, I will crush this thing. <coughs> crush it. I got time, baby. I'm going to crush it. I got the go ahead from Bob, and he's a man of God. <laughs> You'll find out tomorrow. He's a man of God. <laughs> Watch this. You pray for them because it's the Christian thing to do. But you're not expecting them to get healed because you've already located their weaknesses, their fallacies, their flaws, the things that need to change in their life. But when does mercy triumph over judgment? When does love cover a multitude of sin? When does strength bear up in the face of weakness? When is Christ in you greater than what's going on around you? When is Christ in you the hope of glory instead of Christ in them, Christ in you? (laughs) But we pray and we're not expecting much, and when they're not healed or nothing happens, we don't even hold on to faith expecting them to heal because we believe no wonder they weren't healed, man. They've got to change their confession. (coughs) And we hand them a little mini booklet or something, pat them on the hiney, and send them back to their seat. Next. (laughs) Oh, I'm on you now, see. (laughs) We've done this. And we've allowed where their life is to determine where our life is. The sign follows the believer, not the person being prayed for. And you just allowed them to dictate what you believe. You've allowed their weakness to multiply weakness in you. You embrace 30 reasons why men aren't healed, you'll stop the revelation from burning in your heart. You'll come up with 30 reasons why maybe not, we should have one why so. One why they should. You come up with 30 reasons why they're not healed, you'll embrace one of them as your doctrine and it'll keep you from growing in personal revelation that releases the kingdom and you'll always put it on men and you'll never grow past where you're at. And you turn the gospel into a hit miss. Instead of the things I do, if you believe in me, you'll do also. See, we got to believe in him, not others. We're putting our faith in where people are or aren't instead of where he is seated at the right hand making intercession for them, mediating through his blood. So what do you say? Let mercy come. I love to do this with people that are talking fear and Shh, Stop. It's okay, honey. No, I understand you've been through a lot. Shh. It's absolutely irrelevant. Just give me your hand, sweetheart. We're going to pray now, okay? Yeah, but... Shh. <laughs> yeah, but I was praying for 50 times. Shh. Irrelevant to me. I'm not being rude. It's not that I don't care. It's just that I care about the right things and not the wrong thing. I don't care. He's Lord. Wonder if He's Lord and we see that. It's not a reflection on the body. I'm not making light of the 50 people that prayed before. What I'm saying is none of that has to do with right now as we're standing here. What matters is He's Lord. What matters is his blood is speaking on their behalf. What matters is God loves them intensely and has paid the price to get to them and he's waiting for believers to represent that truth. Period. And we've got our reasons why not. And we get why not a lot. We get the failed result a lot because we've got a big wide open door for it. And we can even explain it. And we understand our explanation, but the gospel doesn't. (laughs) I'm going to preach this thing out for time's sake. Unbelief does not have the power to stop the power of God. Unbelief in the Christian, unbelief in the believer can stop the power of God. The sign follows the believer not the sick person in faith. The sign follows, is any among you sick? Let them ask. Call in the elders. That doesn't mean office of elder. It means spiritual, believing, maturing ones. It doesn't mean office of elder. There's offices of elders that don't even believe it's God's will to heal. I'm not being mean or critical. I'm saying it can't mean office of elder. It means spiritual, believing ones. Is any among you sick? 
Call on the elders of the church, have them anoint you, praying over you, anointing you with oil, praying the prayer of faith, belief, fully convinced, understanding the will of God, evidence of what you're hoping for and have, haven't seen yet, the realization and substance of what you're hoping for, evidence of what you haven't seen yet. Let them pray over them the prayer of faith, knowing the will of God, and the prayer of faith. faith. Whose faith? Sick person or the people they called? Why'd they call? Because they're sick and they haven't gotten healed. So they're calling the spiritual believing ones, and the prayer, they pray over them the prayer of who's praying? The people they called on. It doesn't say in parentheses, unless, of course, that they have generational curses, roots in their background, unforgiveness. Does it say that? Or am I missing something? Does your translation say, unless, of course? It says, have them pray the prayer of... When you make all these other things valid and issues, it subverts your faith. They're reasons why not instead of reasons why so. They're anti-faith. Can I be honest? This is going to be heavy. They're anti-Christ because it's anointing. Christ means the anointing. Don't get weirded out and think, you know, you're the beast. <laughs> Anti-Christ means anti-anointing. So these kind of beliefs are anti-anointing. They tell me why the anointing isn't enough and isn't going to flow. We say, well, if they have unforgiveness, they can't be healed. Well, then, oops, for all the people I've seen healed that share their unforgiveness later. You tell me in the Bible when Jesus came to a fallen people under the law of sin and death and they didn't even know who he was and they brought every sick person in the city, city after city, and he healed every single one. You're telling me everyone was pure in faith and knew who Jesus was and didn't have any issues? If that was true, they'd have never crucified him. They crucified the one that healed him. They called him a blasphemer, a heretic a wine-bibber, a glutton, and yet he healed him. Whoa. John 12, 37 says he did all these mighty things among them, and they still did not believe him. If they didn't believe after, they sure didn't believe before. So then he must have did it in the face of unbelief. Whoa. So I bet where they're at isn't the issue. I bet it's where he's at. I bet there's no insecurity or identity crisis with Jesus. I bet who he is on the inside is greater than where they're coming from. So it runs stuff over like a freight train. What happens with us is we get identity crisis. We get other reasons. We create doctrine through unanswered prayers and scenarios that have broken our heart. And all of a sudden, we interpret the gospel through life instead of through Christ. There's a man at a pool, 38 years sick. You know the story? Some people say, well, see, we don't pray for everyone because he prayed for only one at the pool. Who's ever heard somebody say that or preach that? That you don't pray for everyone. Jesus only prayed for one at the porches and there were sick people everywhere. Well, obviously, we're pulling that out of text and didn't even read the next couple of verses because the truth is Jesus withdrew himself because of the crowds because they were trying to make him natural king and he was eluding the crowds. He only prayed for one because the crowds started coming when the man got healed and he snuck away. It's not because he didn't want to heal everybody. What would have happened if they'd all cried out and said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me? What would have happened if they'd have done that? Who in the Bible cried out to him and he ignored him and didn't heal him? All that came to him were what? All that asked what? Receive. See, we represent that same truth, but we misrepresent it because our minds are so involved. But yet it's still possible to represent that truth. <laughs> And that's why we preach this way and grow in this. Am I totally manifesting it? Nope. But I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going to keep growing. I'm going to know more what I'm saying in reality the next time I'm saying it. Because I'm not backing off. I'm going to see more. Okay? Now watch this. He heals the man. The man takes his bed and walks. And the Pharisees say, uh, sir, who told you to... He said, why are you carrying your mat? He said, the man that healed me. See, it's unlawful for you to carry your mat today. It's the Sabbath. The man that healed me told me to carry Well, who healed you? He said, the man could not answer. He knew not, for Jesus withdrew himself. The guy's healed of 38 years of sickness and doesn't even know who's responsible. Now, you tell me he had faith and didn't have unforgiveness. 
He might have been bitter at the world for nobody putting him in the water. I have no one to help me, sir. He might have been mad at the church for not loving him enough to come out and say, look, this guy's been laying here a long time. Back off when the water stirs, we're throwing him in. Instead of the Pharisees just loving like that, they're contesting and criticizing and, and, and confronting the power of God because they're bankrupt of love. Because if they really loved, they'd have been out there. They'd have been recognizing, man, this guy has nobody to help him. He's been laying there for five years. Listen, everybody back away from the pool. The next time God stirs the water, we're going to lift this guy in because he has no one to help him. Boy, that would be awesome. That would represent Jesus. That's what Jesus did. Do you want healed? I don't have anyone to help me. He's the helper. It was, he was saying prophetic, I'm here. Your Savior's come. Take your bed and walk. He didn't even know what was happening or who he was. And the power was still there to heal 38 years of sickness. He didn't interview him. He didn't get him to confess nothing. He didn't get him to nod his head yes. He just said, take your bed and walk. Why? The power and authority of the kingdom working through love. Don't you tell me he had to have faith. He didn't even know who healed him. The story after story. He could do no mighty work in his hometown because of their unbelief. That's the one we mispreach all the time. Well, yeah, but he couldn't do any money work in his home. We preach it as if he prayed for a paralytic and he stayed paralyzed. Come on, you know that didn't happen. Can you even picture that? Can you picture a man paying the price for the town's unbelief and Jesus touching him and coming up powerless? Rise and walk. Rise and walk. Man, you guys are amazing. I can't believe you don't, don't believe me. You rendered me powerless here. I guess I'll go to another town. I can't function. <laughs> well, what happened then? They just thought he was loco. They thought he was nuts. They stereotyped him. He was Mary's and Joseph's boy. Who is he getting off saying he's come from heaven and God's his father when we watch the boy grow up? Where's he getting this stuff and these bright ideas? So when they, he came to his hometown, they disdained him and they rejected him and they walked away. They didn't bring the sick to him. They didn't lay the sick in the streets. Every other city, they poured the sick everywhere. They heard he was coming and Bartimaeus is shouting through the crowds. Women are running up and pulling on his garment. But you go to Nazareth, and they're going, whatever. And they go to their house. They don't bring the leper. They don't bring the paralytic. They don't sit the sick man in the street because they think he's nuts, and he's on a tangent. And they did, rejected him and walked away, so he couldn't do any mighty work because of their unbelief. They didn't receive him there. They rejected him there. Why bring the sick in the streets? He's nuts. So he couldn't function. There was Everybody walked away. Come on, but all that came to him were... All that came to him, it doesn't say, except, of course, for the few in Nazareth that he had no power. All that came to him, how Jesus of Nazareth was anointed with Holy Spirit and power, went around doing good, anointed with power, right? Holy Spirit and power, healing all. It doesn't say, except for the few he prayed for in Nazareth. Oh, I'm on it. I'm coming on. We've mispreached this stuff, and then we believe unbelief has the power to stop God, and it creates unbelief in us, and we represent God. Follow? Y'all all right? There's a lot of analogies, a lot of illustrations. There's a man with a hand is withered in a temple. It's the Sabbath. They want to trap Jesus. Who knows your Bible? They said... Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And they're pointing to the sick guy. It says that they might find means to trap him and accuse him publicly. Did they love the man? Was the man in faith? Does it say anything about the man being there for Jesus to heal him? No, Jesus just showed up in the temple. And when they saw him, they thought, oh, this is great. Here's a, here's a lame man. He's a sucker for healing. He'll heal. We'll just get him in trouble in front of everybody. So they exploit the man's condition... They exploit the man's condition, right, to trap Jesus. Is there any faith in the atmosphere? The total opposite, right? Jesus says, who of you having a sheep falls into a pit wouldn't pull it out on the Sabbath? How much more valuable is a man than a sheep? Sir, stretch forth your hand. What's he saying? I'm healing him because I see God's love for him and his value to God. And I happen to carry that kingdom. 
Because God's in me, and when you see me, you see the Father, and God wants him healed. Be healed. <laughs> Why did the man get healed? Because of his value to God. There was no faith in the atmosphere, and there's no evidence of faith in the man. He's just being exploited for his condition. He's being used as a guinea pig to set up Jesus. He's bait for the trap. And now he's whole. Because love rocks. Amen. Do you get this? But see, if we're all sensitive to atmosphere and we walk into a room and everybody's in unbelief and crying because the prognosis is so terrible and the body looks so withered and all of a sudden we say stuff like, man, there's so much unbelief in the room, God couldn't move. Man, there's so much negativity in here, God couldn't move if we ask Him to. I've heard that scenario. I've used it myself probably 10 years ago because I didn't understand what I see now. Who carries the kingdom? Is greater than he that's in you, than he that's in the world? What dominates an atmosphere? The kingdom of God or the kingdom of the world? So when you walk in a room, what you let in your eyes and your mind and your heart through what's going on around you, it supersedes what the word says and who you are on the inside and it subverts that and you fall into the trap of what you feel and think. And it gets us overwhelmed and we're not in the place. Do you get it? Jairus' daughter dies. We teach that you have to get the unbelief out of the room so God can move. Who's ever heard that teaching? You can't show me that scripturally. He goes, they're mourners. They're hired mourners. They're wailing women and flute players. And they're just doing a job. They're getting paid. They're mourners. They're culturally there to play a certain tune to let the city hear and know someone died so they could go pay their respects because they put them in the ground in about 24 hours because of diseases, to curb diseases and things. They... So, so they would, woo, and they'd play this sad morning song. And the people would come because they'd follow the sound and knew someone died. And the women were on the porches, woo, woo, woo. Jesus comes and says, he's life. He's not, he's the author of life. He can't even see death. He can't, he's not in denial, guys. He's like, guys, chill. She's not dead. She's sleeping. And they're like, whatever. <laughs> and they mock him. They laugh. Are they really mourning if they're there mocking him? No. They're mocking, they're making fun of him, they're like, whatever. And, they're, doo -doo -doo -doo. and he sends them all away. Why? Because he's saying, why are you mourning? Why are you telling the city there's going to be a funeral? Why are you even hired? Why are you even here? Go, we're not having a funeral. There's no need to mourn. Pack up your pipes and go. <laughs> We've turned that into you have to drive the unbelief out of the room. We've preached it like this. We, here's how we've preached it. Little girl, arise. Little girl, arise. Little girl, arise. You, 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 and you out of the room. Little girl, oh. That's how we preached it. That's not what happened. You can have a whole room full of mockers. And Jesus is raising the girl Amen. from the dead. One Holy Spirit went into the corridors of hell and darkness and death and lifted up the Son of God. <laughs> and I don't believe he took Michael and Gabriel to watch his back and send a myriad and a legion this way and that way of angels to back him in corridors and a strategy. We watched too many movies, right? And we're like, the breaking out Jesus. No, light walked into darkness, poof, and darkness went, ah! and when it was all over, he was stripped of authority and power, and Jesus was at the right hand of glory alive. Come on. One spirit. Holy spirit. Yeah. Oh, man. See why we're happy people. It's a gospel to grow into. Possibilities are unlimited. We haven't seen everything we're called to see, but if we'll keep our eyes on Him, we will see more and more and more. If we stop embracing lesser things and partial truths, if we stop just living out of our intellect and we just stop being afraid to believe, be called out of balance and extreme. What was Jesus? 
I mean, God's idea of balance is everybody saved, healed, delivered, redeemed, restored, loved, made whole. Duh. Lazarus tomb. You show me one believer that was joined with Jesus at the tomb. Four dead, four days dead in the grave. Even his own disciples didn't have a clue. He didn't have one partner in faith. And that man flew up from the dead. Unbelief all around him. You sure can't expect faith of Lazarus. He's dead. <laughs> but you would think by now the disciples would be getting a clue, but you don't know because you weren't there. I don't know. I wasn't there. But you know what the disciples were stuck with? The fear of death. They said, why would you go to Judea when the last time you were there, you were almost stoned and killed? If you go back there, they will surely kill you. He said, we must go. We got to get him up. Didn't he say that? We got to get him up. He said, uh, Lord. He said, our brother Lazarus sleeps and we must go so we can get him up. See, he didn't even say he's dead. He said he sleeps. He's giving him a chance to get on page. And, and they said, but, but Lord, if he sleeps, literally hearing him, he'll be fine. He'll sleep it off. He'll break out in a little sweat. He'll get up fever. We'll be going, he'll be cool. Man, we don't need to go there. Because <laughs> they're thinking rocks. <laughs> we don't need to go there. If he sleeps, hey, let him sleep it off. He'll wake up in the morning. Hey, we'll just pray from here. He'll be fine. Actually, guys, he's dead. And we got to go, and I'm glad for your sakes, because you're going to see the glory of God. You think they'd be going, dude, you're kidding me. You're going to get him up? Come on, guys, we got to see this. Here's what they said. Thomas said, when he said that and started walking down the road, Thomas said, come on, guys, let's go die with him there. He just said, I'm going to get Lazarus up from the dead, and the best they could do was, well, let's go with him and die with him. Why? Because of the fear of death. All they could think of was death. That's all you could see is death. You can't hold them responsible. They were under the fear of the bondage of death. So they couldn't even hear, I'm going to raise him from the dead. They couldn't hear that when Jesus said he's going to raise from the dead. How many times did Jesus say, I'm going to die, be buried, and raise on the third day? Five, six times in the gospel, I'm going to raise on the third day. And it says they were deeply filled with sorrow and grief. Why? Because the fear of death. Death was finality. It ruled them. They couldn't hear what the Spirit of the Lord was saying because death owned them. Because if, if it wasn't that way, they'd have been waiting at the tomb with banners and flags. Five, four, three, two. Everything he ever said came to pass. Sure he's going to rise. But yet Jesus, I'll rise on the third day. And nobody's there at the tomb. Everybody's in fear for their lives. Isn't that amazing? So he goes to the tomb. Thomas, and the only reason the twelve are there is to, be, to die with him. So the whole time they're there, they're waiting for the persecution. Mary and Martha run out. Martha and then Mary cry, If you'd have been here, Lord, my brother wouldn't have died. Well, he's here now. <laughs> See, death, finality. Do you hear the sting in that? If you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. A birthday rolls around, an anniversary, a holiday with an empty chair. Next thing you know, the grief, the remorse, the bitterness. Why weren't you here? I told you and you didn't come for days after you knew. Where were you, Lord? Why weren't you there to deliver my brother? And all of a sudden, your love for God turns into the bitterness of personal loss. And all of a sudden, God is accused and subpoenaed in the court of your mind. And if he'd have been there, I wouldn't be missing my brother. Oh, that one's sticking. Don't you let that happen to your heart. Because that's what could happen to theirs. It's just good pastoral preaching right there. I'll protect sheep from unnecessary stuff towards God when all he ever did was send his son to make it right. If you'd have been here, your brother will rise again. Oh, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection. I am the resurrection. 
What was he saying? Take heart, I'm here. I am the resurrection life. We ain't waiting for that day. I'm here. Let's get it on. She cried. She ran, got Mary. She didn't get it. Mary came, said the same thing. If you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. The Jews are looking, crying with her, saying, surely this man who opened the eyes of the blind, couldn't he have kept this man from dying? That's what they were saying in your Bible. They're all weeping. Jesus grieves. He groans inside. He groans. The word groaned, if you study it, means vexed. Vexed, troubled, and to be indignant toward. He was face to face with the fall of man. He came to his own and his own received him not. They didn't look anything like they were created to be. And they couldn't see the truth about him or who they were. Life was staring them in the face. And all they could honor was death. He went, oh. Because he's face to face with the blight of the fall of man. And he says, where have you laid him? He was weeping. We say, see, he was so, why would he weep for Lazarus when he's about to get up? He's weeping because man can't see life in the face of death. He's weeping because he's standing in front of his own and his own can't even see who he is. Because they're ruled by the fall of man. His own disciples don't even. He goes and he says, mm, and he groans again because of the things that are going on. And, and, and he says, take away the stone. What he's saying is, I can't take anymore. I've got to show you. Martha says, you know, it's going to stink if you move the stone. Listen to what he said to her. It's amazing what he said. Didn't I say to you that if you believe, made it personal, if you believe, Deborah, you will see the glory of God. Now watch close, because I believe. But wow. He wasn't saying, if you join forces with me and agree with me, maybe we can get your brother up. He was saying, what you're about to see through me is your destiny. Christ in you. You're about to witness the Christ. And the Christ in you is the hope of glory. And the things I do, you shall do if you believe. Wasn't one believer in the whole place except Jesus. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And death itself couldn't stop the power of God in the face of unbelief. Matthew 17, his own disciples prayed for an epileptic boy. The reason I'm telling you is when you go out in the streets and love somebody, get your eyes off of them and get your eyes on God's love for them. Yeah. Get your eyes on the price Jesus paid for them. Settle in your heart it's God's will to heal and restore humanity. Get your heart set on the will of God to restore period. Even if you're going through something that, that, that it's an enigma to you and you haven't found resolve in your own life, you haven't been healed, you've been prayed for a thousand times and you still have a condition, you still qualify to believe God's will. In fact, the fact of you reaching out and praying beyond your condition and praying means you honor the gospel above your experience and you're saying, I believe in spite of. When you stop and wait for things, then you're saying, well, I'll, you know, to be determined. I have to see to believe. He says, if you believe, lay your hands on the sick. He said, unless, of course, you're going through stuff yourself. He didn't say that. If you believe, the sign of believing is no matter what you're going through, you pray for the sick. There was a time witchcraft came on me and I was walking around with a balloon leg twice the size of this one. Doctors said they were probably going to have to amputate it and I'm just dragging it around. It was dead weight. It was dead weight. And all I could do was preach the gospel and live. I wasn't in denial. I wasn't trying to cheer myself on. I couldn't see this. I could see him. People say, yeah, but look at your leg. I didn't think we were supposed to do that. I thought we looked to him. I saw eight people healed when I was dragging my leg around of things that they were prayed for hundreds of times for and were never healed. But the humility of that, the statement of that, not saying, well, what about my leg? Well, how can I pray for them when I'm going through my own thing and can't get a breakthrough? How can I? <laughs> Z -z 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 
It's not about that. I'm not trying to figure that out. I can't even explain that. I just know he's amazing and he loves me. And I know down in my heart I'm okay and I'm going to be fine. And you can be too. That's pride. You don't let what you're going through determine who you are. You let what he went through determine who you are. You don't let your circumstance define God. God's in position to define your circumstance. Come on, don't mix it up. My leg should never be given the ability to dictate God. God's in position to dictate my leg. <laughs> Mm. You follow me? But I prayed for the sick in that process and saw a whole bunch of people healed. So you go out and you pray. Matthew 17. I got about 15 minutes. I want to do this quick. The reason I'm telling you this is because I want you to realize the honor and privilege you have of carrying the kingdom. Don't you sell cheap. Don't you put it on somebody else. Don't you tell somebody, well, if you go get faith, brother, you can be healed. You know, there's a truth there. Somebody could get faith and get healed, but that's not your place. Who did Jesus ever say, look, man, who did Jesus ever pray for? Okay, here's Rick sitting. Okay, Rick's coming to Jesus in the Gospels, and Jesus prays for him, and nothing happens. He says, well, buddy, you know what? If you believe you can uh, be healed, why don't you go and just work on your faith? You can be made better. Did Jesus do that to anybody? He affirmed men's faith when it was there. But when he didn't affirm men's faith, whose faith healed him? His. So who did he ever tell to go get more faith and they could be healed? Then why do we do that? He never did that. See, if we're not careful, we'll explain away powerlessness and impotency and we'll put it on people instead of growing in a revelation and we'll sell out the fact that we can grow up into him in all things and we'll just put it on something and never grow and increase. I won't do that to myself. Don't you do that to yourself. Because of this right here. This is going to seal it down, okay? Do you see why we're doing this? Because it gives you boldness to approach people and pray. Because it doesn't matter if they're cursing. It doesn't matter where they just came from. It doesn't matter if they're sitting there with somebody in adultery. Sometimes people know they're doing that stuff. Sometimes people have been raised better and they have different values in their life than they're expressing and living. Like a lady in the bathroom that says, I've been walked away from the Lord. Well, you don't know what people are carrying and they just need one touch of compassion, one touch of love to knock them back to their senses, to come to themselves and say, what was I doing? What was I thinking? Thing. All of a sudden they're sitting there and they know they're guilty. They already know they're guilty. They're so ashamed they can't even look in the mirror. They're sleeping around and their wife doesn't even know it. And their wife is a beautiful, awesome woman and she's not even doing anything wrong. They're just on a tangent living lascivious and they're hurting her and they're destroyed inside. And all of a sudden Jesus walks up and doesn't read their mail and uh, he comes up and he heals them or gives a word or touches their heart. And now they're broken because in the midst of all this they already know God came and showed mercy. Are you kidding me? The goodness of God leads men to repent. Prayed for a lady with metastatic breast cancer. It went all through her organs, all through her bones. She was a secret alcoholic, Christian. Went to church all the time. Drinking herself to sleep every night, even before the cancer. It was her secret. Couldn't go to bed without getting drunk. Just drinking, drinking. Nobody knew. But her own conscience. And it was defiling her. And God loves her. He's not mad at her. He's not disappointed. He's not thinking, what a hypocrite. He realizes there's something desperately wrong on the inside that he would love to fix. She comes for prayer, metastatic cancer. She's probably not qualified in the average Christian mind. She probably has to repent and turn from her sin. I found where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. What will set you free from the desire of sin is the profuseness of his love. <laughs> no man ever changed himself. God changes men through his love. <laughs> Prayed for that lady. She went home. Didn't think much of it because she's disqualified. She's a loser. God will never touch her. She's not qualified. She goes to bed. Drunk. Drunk next night. Drunk next night. Goes to a doctor. He scans her whole body to tell her how much worse it got. Goes home. Drunk. Drunk. Two days later, test results. We don't know how to tell you this. We don't know what happened. There's not one trace of cancer in your entire body. This is impossible. She's stunned. She told this testimony. She's going to her car stunned. She's thinking, how can this be? How can I have cancer? She sits in a car. It took her this long. She sits because you get so far from God. 
in your mind and heart. She sits in her car and realizes, oh my God, it's when, when they pray. And I've been drinking. And God, it did. <sighs> we get the phone call while she's crying hysterically in her car because it hits her. God healed me. And all I thought was I was a drunk and a hypocrite. And God loved me in the face of my pain. The desire to drink instantly left her. She never tried to not drink. It just left her because love came and made things right. I don't know about you. That's good tidings of great joy. That's peace to all people. There's so many stories. Todd was walking through a hotel with me and he got a word on a young girl whose foot was hurting. He went in and got a word on her foot. She's 20, a couple years old, 23. She said when she was three, she hurt her foot. She's been walking in pain ever since for 20 years. She said, that's amazing. How do you know my foot was hurting? I just heard it. Jesus, he loves you. Let's just pray. It gets better. Bam. Her foot's healed. Are you kidding me? Wow. She's totally healed. Instantly healed. He says, man, why do I keep hearing mother-in-law? Her face contorts and changes. This vile anger rises up. Spewing out of her about her mother-in-law, and she's already healed. Oops. Well, you know, unless they're, uh, you know, they're in unforgiveness, they can't be healed. I'd encourage you to throw that one away because what's happening is it subverts your faith and God's ability to heal them in the midst of anything and love changing anything and love covering the multitude of sin. We've indoctrinated ourselves at the cost of faith. If he had that belief and something's not happening right away, then he's just going to sell out quick. He's not even going to contend and believe because, well, I guess she's got issues. I've found in most cases, who doesn't? And he still came and shed his blood. So he said, ma'am, you got to understand. Stan, honey, look what's happening to your heart. Do you realize God just came and healed you and loved you and he walked her through and next thing you know, she realized the sin of her heart. That God was merciful to her. She ought to be merciful. God healed her in spite of her. She wasn't thinking God. She's not going after God. She's doing things that aren't God. She knows that. And her foot's healed. I bet he's not looking at her like she's looking at mother-in-law. All of a sudden, a conviction came. She cried and repented and asked God to forgive her and forgave verbally her her mother-in-law. Remember that? Guess what she was first? Healed. Oops. If you don't have that belief, you won't get those results. A lot of times our results are nothing more than directly connected to our belief system. We get what we believe in the kingdom. The sign follows believers. I got to do this in 10 minutes, Gary. Verse 14, Matthew 17. When they'd come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. He's an epileptic, suffers severely. He's often falling into the fire, often into the water. Look at verse 16. It's troublesome. It just... So I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. Ever happened to you? It's happened to me too much. Once is too much. It's happened to me too much. I've seen people come with terminal cancer, and I've seen them go and die. It's not a reflection of the gospel means I need to grow. I'm growing. I'm not discouraged. I'm not taking it personal. I'm not in this for me. Remember, I'm not going to throw a pity trip, turn tail, and run. I'm not going to say, well, I feel like a fool. Well, why didn't God answer? Well, I prayed and prayed and prayed, and I believed, and God didn't move. No, the Bible says when we have faith, the mountain moves. The evidence of faith is the mountain moving. Let's get over ourselves. Let's, Let's be able to talk about this with ruffling our feathers and getting into a fight. Let's stop making it about us. We get so personal with loss and so sentimental that we can't even talk about this stuff because we're defending our feelings and our loss and we're saving face spiritually at the cost of truth. And if Jesus talked to his disciples this way, I bet he's talking to us this way. Come on, how do you know I didn't lose people in my life? How do you know I haven't lost loved ones? How do you know I haven't suffered through some pain? And I've been on my bed. See, I'm in this thing. I'm in this thing. I put myself in impossible situations, excited to see God. (laughs) I watched a handful of folks come out of comas. 
and I've seen some that didn't. The fact that I've seen some come out makes me excited to go after the next one because this word says they can. Watch this. I may have never seen one come out of a coma, and I'm still encouraged to pray because it says they can. Yeah, but brother, you ain't never seen it. Yeah, but I see it here. I could pray for 15 people and lose them to cancer, and I'm not going to create a theology. It just means that I've got to keep believing because me to continue to pray says I believe the gospel over my experience. I believe the gospel over my intellect. I believe the gospel over my mindsets. I believe the gospel. And you're going to grow up in him in all things because the Bible says all things are possible to them that believe. And if I believe, I'll say to the mountain, not cry out to God, I'll say to the mountain, move. Cancer, get out of their body. The mercy of God cries out for them. The blood of Jesus pays the price for them. You loose yourself from them in Jesus' name. Right? And faith says to the mountain, and the mountain what? So is the evidence of faith speaking to the mountain or the mountain moving? A lot of people speaking at mountains. But the evidence of faith is the mountain moving. Come on, the word says that. So let's stay humble. I brought him to the disciples. They could not what? <laughs> right? <laughs> Jesus said, faithless and perverse generation. That's not a slam and he's not mad. He's full of passion. He's heading to the cross. He's about to die. He's going to Jerusalem and he's going to be crucified, raised on the third day, and he's going to hand the baton to these 11 guys. He's going to hand the baton of the New Covenant, New Testament church to 11 men. So if Joey's one of them, he's like, Joey, come on, how long shall I be with you, buddy? How long am I going to bear with you? What you're letting go through your mind when you're touching that boy, what you're seeing through them seizures and what you're seeing not happen affects where you're praying from. And you forget who you are because of me. And it's causing a perverse thing to take place, corrupted thinking, twisted thinking, and it's causing doubt in you. And Joey, how long shall I be here? How long shall I bear with you? You've got to get this. Bring the boy to me. I'll show you. That's what he's saying. He's saying, you faithless, perverse, there's something going on in your mind, self-conscious, seizures, epilepsy. If they thought he was cured, he wasn't seizing. Since he wasn't cured, he must have kept seizing. They pray their best prayer and he's still seizing. Did it ever happen to you? And then your mind engages. What should I pray next? What should I try? This isn't working. I wonder why he's still seizing. I wonder why God didn't come. You know, if Jesus would be praying, he'd be healed by now. I wonder what I'm doing wrong. And from that moment, everything you pray is from the position of what's not happening. And you're on the run, grabbing for straws, instead of who you are in Christ and who he is through you. Jesus said, something's going on here. It's perverse thinking. It's corrupted, twisted thinking. It triggers here. But bring the boy to me. Would he talk to his disciples this way if they didn't have the grace to heal the boy? If they had no green light from heaven, would he talk like that? Would he correct them or would he just say, guys, I appreciate your zeal. Man, you guys are go-getters, but this was reserved for me, but thanks for trying. No, he said, guys, what are you doing? You're forgetting to see who you are because of me. You're getting your eyes on other things. You've got to get this because I'm handing you the baton. I'm not going to be here soon. I'm going to sit at the right hand of the Father and greater things will you do. You've got to get this. Bring the boy to me. Boom, he heals him instantly. Why? Because it was the will of God to heal the boy. Was it the will of God to heal the boy? Was he healed when the disciples prayed? Oops. Why don't we talk about this stuff in church? Nobody ever preached this to me. We just preach, well, it wasn't God's time. It mustn't have been God's will. Well, I guess God has a sovereign plan. Well, who knows? God works in mysterious ways. Ah! It's right here. They prayed. He wasn't healed. And Jesus had a lot to say about it to help us. Why don't we talk about it? Was it the will of God to heal the boy? Was he healed when his disciples prayed? Ugh then we ought to pay attention because it's happened to every one of us that's ever prayed for the sick. Bring the boy to me. Jesus rebuked the thing that went out of him. The disciple came privately. The disciples can bless their hearts. I'm glad they did this. They came privately. Why, direct question, why couldn't we cast it out? Well, the father was in unbelief and you know he had some pretty heavy generational curses over his life and he was really in fear and this thing's tracking from great-great-grandpa, and you don't realize it's the masonry thing, and it's just strong issues, man, so. <laughs> what did Jesus say? Why couldn't we do it? What did Jesus say? Because of what you guys fail to see. That's what he's saying. 
But see, when we say it's because of your unbelief, you say, well, don't tell me I didn't have faith. And people ruffle feathers over that stuff and show they're still very much alive. If I'm touching the terminal sick and they're dying, I need Jesus to talk to me. I don't need to be offended. I don't need to be proud. I need Jesus to talk to me. And I need to see, help me, Jesus. Show me what I'm not seeing. Because you said they have to live, and God, I thank you for growing me up in fatherhood. I don't need to be offended. Well, don't tell me I didn't have faith. I didn't. Jesus said it was their unbelief. Take it up with him. I bet he's right. He's not saying, well, it's because you don't have faith. He's saying it's what you fail to see. Why couldn't we heal the boy, Jesus? He didn't blame it on anything but what they're lacking to see is a revelation. He didn't blame it on unforgiveness in the dad, roots and strongholds. He didn't say, well, that spirit is way more powerful. He said, it's your unbelief, God. Is that in your Bible, or is it only in mine? I know that sounds sarcastic. It wasn't. I want you to admit that's in your Bible, and it's the word that can't lie because of your unbelief. He only camps there for a second. Four words, because of your unbelief. But truly, I tell you this, Priscilla, watch this. Priscilla says, Lord, why? Why, why, did, why didn't we get the answer? Why didn't we see? Priscilla, because it's what you fell to see, honey. But I tell you this, if you see what I see, you'll do what I do. Yeah. So, Priscilla, it's because of what you're failing to see, but I tell you this, Priscilla, if you have faith, you, honey, will say to the mountain, move, and that mountain will pick up and move, and nothing, Priscilla, nothing will be impossible for you. <clears throat> However, Priscilla, this kind, what kind? This kind of ability to think apart from truth. Are they talking about the spirit? Or unbelief? What's the problem? The spirit or unbelief? This kind of unbelief, this kind of twisted thinking, this kind of corrupted thinking won't get rooted out of your life unless you continue in the place of God's presence through prayer and fasting so that your mind gets renewed in the spirit of your mind and you begin to look through the very eye of Christ. So let me finish it this way and run it straight through. Priscilla asks him the question, Priscilla, honey, it's because of what you're failing to see. But honey, I tell you the truth. If you see, you'll say to the mountain, move. And Priscilla, the mountain will move. And honey, nothing is impossible. I've given you the kingdom. Whatever you say in my name, it shall be done. However, the ability to think apart from me won't be resolved in your life unless you stay in the presence of God and let your identity continue to be one with who he is. That's what he's saying. Why'd they come up short? Because they fail to see who Christ is in them. It had nothing to do with anything else. Why do we make it everything else? If we make it everything else, it's at the cost of the kingdom that's here manifesting. And we're guaranteed to get the same pale results that we've seen. But if we'll be humble and humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God in due time, he will lift us up. You get it? Don't you let unbelief stop the power of God. Don't you let where people are or aren't determine who He is. You let who He is in you 